Uh, I was asked to talk about Russian oil and gas, and obviously uh, this is a very complex uh, and very wide topic. But uh, what I wanted to do is really to uh, bring some key points for today. And first time I'm going to talk about oil and then in the second part about uh, Russian gas. Uh, with regards to uh, the oil sector developments, I'm going to play it in the context of the big, of the so-called big three players, uh, Russia, Saudi Arabia, and the United States, because these are really the key uh, forces that are going to shape the future of uh, the oil market going forward. We've been through uh, major shocks during 2014, 2019, uh, the oil markets experienced uh, a supply side shock as uh, tight oil output increased uh, tremendously and uh, it caused APEC to react and it caused Russia to change its strategy and join uh, APEC in, in uh, the efforts to uh, manage the market. In 2020, we had a major demand side shock as uh, COVID-19 uh, slowed down economic activity, uh, caused unprecedented decline in oil demand, and also uh, uh, called for major, major response from oil producing nations. And so uh, when uh, we look at what has happened over all these years, obviously, uh, the key big change was, as I said, was this tremendous surge in uh, US output. And uh, the lines on this graph, they represent incremental increases in uh, oil production from 2007, uh, the baseline. And generally you see that uh, for the US, it meant tremendous, tremendous, uh, almost uh, 8 million barrels per day incremental increase in uh, uh, oil and uh, condensate production. Uh, Saudi Arabia and Russia, uh, they, in comparison, they could only increase uh, their shares relatively modestly and they had to uh, manage the market. Uh, as, therefore, as a result, the US really captured most of the incremental increase in oil demand of all these years. And uh, in 2020, uh, we have seen this challenge of uh, a demand side shock. Uh, going forward, I think it's very interesting uh, to look at this big issue. What is going to happen when the market rebalances? And we already see in the first signs of the rebalance in prices have been up to over $50 per barrel. And obviously when uh, we uh, have the world goes through this massive immunization over the course of uh, 2021, uh, it will be reopening for business gradually. The timing for this is uncertain, but either by the end of 21 or uh, in 2022, the world will reopen for business. Uh, this will bring demand back. This obviously uh, will bring oil price to even higher levels than it is now. So the key question is, uh, will the oil conundrum return? And by conundrum, I mean this uh, problem of uh, market managers, versus uh, free riders. The US has been a free rider, uh, capturing uh, demand at the expense of other players, probably with uh, much lower production costs, especially uh, with regards to Saudi Arabia. And therefore, uh, the managers of the market, APEC and uh, Russia recently, they would have somehow to chart their course uh, with regards to this uh, response from the US tight oil, uh, this new source of supply, which is reactive, which uh, responds to short cycle price signals. And so the key signpost to watch will be how the US is going, how the US tight oil producers are going to uh, deal uh, with their production going forward. Uh, the US has produced a miracle in terms of uh, delivering volumes to the market, but at the same time, in terms of financial uh, results, it has been a bust. The tight oil uh, industry in the United States 
has not produced positive cash flows for the past 10 years. It has been basically growing volumes, but uh, it has been extremely disappointing for the investors to see how the cash flows have remained in the negative territories all these years. And so now the key issue for the US, of course, is the return to profitability. Whether this would require a significantly high and break-even price, uh, it remains to be seen. But we are looking at a situation when uh, $50 oil may not be enough to restart this tremendous growth from uh, US frackers. They may need higher price. This obviously would work uh, better for uh, OPEC plus as well. But uh, uh, there, there's a caveat here. Uh, if oil price goes too high, uh, it may mean that alternative sources of energy, uh, which are now being heavily promoted by the proponents of this quick and uh, rapid energy transition, they would basically, they would gain uh, additional uh, arguments to advance their cause. And so in addition to the immediate uh, goal of rebalancing the market and maybe achieving slightly higher prices than we see now, somewhere in the sustainable price range between 50 and $70. Uh, the longer term challenge, of course, is how to uh, respond to this uh, competition from alternative sources of energy, non-oil sources of energy. And uh, I think this is the key question going forward. Well, with that, I want to sort of to switch gears and to talk a little bit about Russian gas, because as I said, we are limited with time and uh, we need to cover uh, lots and lots of issues. With gas, uh, the story has also been extremely interesting. And uh, we have seen also decline in gas demand, not as dramatic as on the oil side, but still a very significant decline in oil, uh, in gas demand, especially in Europe and very significant drop in gas prices uh, to unbelievably low levels, which probably uh, meant that only near term variable costs could be covered for most of the producers, but not their full costs. And as a result, what we have been through in 2020 was uh, the year of extreme volatility, but it was, also, it was also a year of two distinct halves. During the first half of the year, uh, LNG expanded and uh, took additional market share and Gazprom was a major loser. However, in the second half of the year, uh, prices were so low first that uh, LNG simply uh, could not go. It basically, there were so many shut-in uh, LNG projects in the US and uh, eventually this flow of additional LNG to Europe uh, started to uh, dissipate and we have seen a major bounce back from Gazprom. And now of course prices are back, uh, record uh, time spot uh, LNG prices in Asia over $20 per MBTU. Uh, prices started to pick up strongly uh, in Europe as well, over $10 per MBTU at TTF uh, right now. And uh, as a result, generally we see again uh, that uh, the market demonstrated extreme volatility and LNG uh, basically confirmed it's, it's a reputation as a very volatile, as very cyclical market. Uh, that's uh, again, a major challenge for the buyers as they need to assess what strategies they need to uh, have with regards to long-term contracts, with regards to the purchases of LNG at the spot market, and uh, with regards to uh, which uh, suppliers are most reliable. This brings the issue of uh, Russian gas to Europe uh, to the front. Uh, we have been witnesses to this extreme opposition uh, coming from the US to new Russian pipeline gas project, Nord Stream 2 which uh, is supposed to connect new Russian gas production on the Imal Peninsula with uh, Europe via undersea pipelines, under the Baltic Sea pipelines. And uh, this opposition took form uh, of the sanctions and uh, these sanctions have expanded. Nevertheless, uh, the pipeline, which now is 95% completed on the short section remains to be laid in the Danish section of uh, the Baltic Sea. 
uh, I still proceed in Russia, basically took the attitude, well, damn the torpedoes, we proceed. And uh, the construction in the Danish section is going to restart in, in, in a couple of days. They have only 120 kilometers of uh, pipe to lay. And uh, even with all the restrictions and with the necessity to use only Russian vessels, pipeline vessels, we're still looking at uh, the springtime as the timing for possible finalization of the pipeline. Uh, obviously, the sanctions go beyond that. They uh, now will be uh, trying to limit the opportunities for Russia to certify the pipeline and also in the future to limit the throughput. But uh, in our assessment, generally, there's no way uh, the pipeline construction can be stopped. Uh, and uh, this reflects not only uh, Russia's push to build it, but also uh, the realization of uh, many people in Europe, first of all in Germany, that this is uh, a commercial project and a project that needs to be done if Europe really wants to uh, maintain uh, reliable supplies of natural gas in the medium term. Uh, and it looks as uh, there's no real alternative to that for many European countries. Well, uh, with that, I would like to conclude my short remarks and I look forward to uh, the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you, Vitaly, very, very interesting. And I'll just pick up on your last point about Nord Stream 2 and the fact that uh, Gazprom has received um, the, the okay, the green light for uh, the pipes to be laid, uh, the pipeline on the Danish shelf back in October. Um, but with this, with this all move forward in 2021, with the upcoming leadership, new leadership in the US and the German elections in September. How do you see that uh, developing? Oh, well, I don't think that uh, there will be anything new in terms of sanctions. In fact, uh, if anything may happen, it probably will be some attempt by the new US administration to uh, mend ties with Germany. Uh, because what we have seen was an example of indecent proposal, so to say. Uh, the German, uh, the German uh, politicians, or at least most of them, were quite unhappy about this uh, push. And uh, most of the commentators really uh, were making the point about US meddling into European affairs. And uh, the project, indeed, uh, is the bilateral project which involves, in addition to uh, Russia and Germany, uh, several major European gas companies. And so it is it is really a mutually beneficial deal for uh, Russia and Europe. So uh, for the US to claim that this is a redundant pipeline, that uh, its only purpose is to uh, bypass Ukraine, uh, I think it's it's uh, a major policy mistake. It's, a, it's also a strategic blunder because uh, the arguments that the pipeline is redundant basically don't hold water. Uh, it is uh, a link that connects a brand new source of supply in the Imal Peninsula with, uh, by the shortest route with the German's uh, gas market. And uh, this Himal gas it doesn't want to flow via the Ukrainian corridor. It won't flow via the Ukrainian corridor. If North Stream were to be blocked, uh, uh, the Himal new gas would either uh, go to the international markets in the form of LNG, or it would uh, go to China via this new plant pipeline. And in fact, speaking of China, I think that's a very good development here. Uh, the uh, Power of Siberia pipeline started delivering gas to China uh, since December 2019. In 2020, 4.1 billion uh, cubic meters of gas were delivered. Uh, and uh, it's going to ramp up relatively quickly up to 38 BCM by 2025. And there are so many plans to expand this to build new pipelines to China. I think we're going to be surprised on, on, uh, on how quickly <laughs> Russia is going to give it to Asia with its gas supplies. Mm -hmm. but in form of a very large deal. Yeah. deal. Yes, yes, exactly. So that will supply a very long term contract there with, with China. Um, let me tell you, I have a question from someone in the chat who is asking, what is Russia's biggest incentive to stick with this OPEC plus group going forward? 
And uh, how long do you see this relationship sustaining post April 2022? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, that, that's an excellent question. Well, I think for Russia, uh, it is important to have uh, a stable and predictable oil price. And so this excess volatility, we have seen prices jumping uh, from extreme highs to uh, low the $20 per barrel. It's, it's, it's really bad. So Russia has this inherent interest in uh, managing the market uh, and uh, in avoiding uh, sort of price volatility, especially on the downside. At the same time, of course, uh, uh, Russia is not a natural swing producer. So obviously there's, there's some tension in its relations with Saudi Arabia when it comes uh, to the situation like in, in, uh, in March of 2020, when uh, the decision about drastic cuts, production cuts had to be made. Uh, but still, uh, Russia, when it joined OPEC Plus, I think it wanted to avoid price volatility. Its idea of cooperation was really about reining in its uh, production increases rather than about being a swing producer and cutting production. Uh, but still, I think that there are good possibilities for Saudi Arabia and Russia to continue this cooperation, especially now when uh, demand is going to pick up and uh, sort of this, this, uh, this need to swing uh, is going to be less. And I think that uh, we are really going to see some, some uh, major changes with regards to uh, this surge of production for, coming from the US. Uh, I think it, it really has reached some limits in terms of uh, this uh, unstoppable production growth. It would be easier for Saudi Arabia and Russia to cooperate in this sense. Absolutely, yes. Um, I had another question on the combination of the pandemic, the Western sanctions, sort of low oil price and OPEC plus cuts suggest that the economic situation in Russia is a lot worse than reported. What is your outlook for 2021 on an economic, uh, an economic point of view? Uh, well, obviously, we, uh, the whole world has been going through very difficult times. Russia is, is, is uh, by, by all means, is, is, uh, is not an exception. Uh, having said that, Russia managed to solve some key problems. First of all, it's budgetary problems by going through this massive uh, depreciation of the ruble, of the Russian currency. And uh, by depreciating the ruble, first of all, it lowered uh the dollar costs of its uh supply in terms of oil and gas but it also solved the problem for the budget russia has a balanced budget and it can really uh sort of finance most of its social programs pretty easily besides it has a very significant uh hard currency reserves and uh russia's central bank managed to grow those reserves even under those adverse circumstances during 2020. Uh, interestingly, Russia's uh, foreign currency reserve succeeded Saudi Arabia last year. And so ha they have been growing uh, very strongly at the same time as uh, Saudi's reserves have been depleting because Saudis had to uh, finance their budget deficits uh, essentially uh, by spending their reserves. Right. So it's it's again it's 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 uh, maybe not as good as many people uh, would have expected, but uh, the situation in Russia is is generally quite sustainable in the near term. Mm -hmm. Well, the whole world is going through this pandemic. Obviously, that, that that's what it's, uh, it's, it's everyone's suffering. So, in many ways, it's how quickly we get out of it uh, following this whole the, the vaccine and the rollout of the vaccine worldwide. Vitaly, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it uh, for now. That's all we have time for. I'd like to thank you very much for your interesting insights. It's a topic we can go on for for hours. There's a lot packed in there. Uh, I'd like to thank our attendees for joining us from across the globe. And we certainly look forward to seeing you shortly in the plenary session of the forum. Thank you very much. Thank Vitaly. you very much. Thank you.